Welcome to Stonewall Farm. My name is Julie Davidson. I'm the executive director here at Stonewall Farm. We're a nonprofit agricultural education center located in Keene, New Hampshire. And our mission is to teach and demonstrate regenerative agriculture to people of all ages so that we can ensure vibrant communities, a healthy planet, and um, a secure food system. And so we work to achieve that goal using three main strategies. One is demonstration and innovation. The second is education and um, teaching. And the third is advocacy and engagement. And so our farm, which is about 120 acres, is about half of it is protected with the Forest Society of New, New Hampshire, and the other half is in agricultural use. We have about 30 acres total that are in production, and the rest is forested, and we have an extensive trail system here that's heavily used by the biking and hiking community, so a lot of people will come here to access the trails, um, but also to visit the farm. Our farm is open to the public, free of charge, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so people can come visit the farm, visit the barns and animals, and get up close and personal with a working farm. Um, the, this land has been a working farm since the land was originally cleared in the 1700s. The early settlers, the farmhouse was back that way in our gardens, and so um, they had cleared the land and they used it for a variety of agricultural purposes. In the 1800s, it became a working dairy farm primarily, and it has been up until this day. So um, it's been a working dairy farm for well over 100 years now. Uh, the last private owner of the land, Norman Chase, he had no heirs, he had no one to pass on the farm to, and so he was concerned that this land would go into development. It was in the late 80s at the time a lot of land was being developed for strip malls, shopping malls, that sort of thing, and so he did not want to see that happen to this land. Um, and so luckily there was a neighbor nearby who shared his vision, purchased the land, and had a vision of gifting this farm to the community. So essentially, you know, Stonewall Farm was incorporated as a nonprofit, as a gift to the Monadnock region and beyond. And so we carry on that mission today, 25 years later, um, doing a variety of activities here. Um, and our mission has evolved slightly because we're also working and focusing on um, teaching regenerative agriculture with a new partnership with the Savory Institute. And the Savory Institute is a international nonprofit, one of the top 10 regenerative organizations internationally that's working to restore the world's glass, grasslands through holistic management. And so we became a hub with the Savory Institute in 2018. And there are, we're part of a global network of hubs around the world. Um, we're one of two right now in New England. And we teach regenerative farming and holistic management um, so that people, um, you know, can adopt these practices um, and accelerate the growth of regenerative agriculture throughout the world. But we also, um, so we teach the classes and we also teach what's called ecological outcome monitoring. It's a tool that farmers can use to um, monitor the land and changes over time. Um, and it gives both short-term and long-term feedback. So those are primarily the two functions that, that we serve as um, a savory hub. But we also have a lot of other programs. We have educational programs for children um, ages three on up to adults. Um, people can come and take a variety of classes here from tree identification to um, seed saving. Um, we have a, a variety of programs and courses throughout the year. And we also just welcome visitors to the farm. Um, our main crops are, um, we're a certified organic farm. And so we grow specialty crops, strawberries, broccoli. We offer a CSA um, throughout the year. And then we also ship our organic milk to Stonyfield. Um, and we use some of it to bottle and sell here. We have a farm store located here that we sell a lot of our products, but also a lot of 
farm products from local producers throughout the region. So today on our farm tour, we're going to talk about how we manage soil health here at the farm. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we started implementing a variety of new practices here at the farm. Um, and so we're going to share those with you today, um, both what worked well and what didn't work so well, because sometimes that can be as valuable as what worked well. Um, and we'll start off looking at the dairy and our grazing program here. I'll talk a little bit about what things were like when we started and um, where we hope to go with that. And then we'll also look at our specialty crops where we've um, implemented uh, no-till and a variety of other practices here. So. Hi, we're in one of our pastures here at Stonewall Farm that we use for grazing. We graze approximately 28 acres of pasture here. Um, and for about the past 10 years, we've been using a, a simple rotation plan as um, part of the organic system of management. Three years ago, we started using adaptive multi-paddock grazing along with holistic management. And the key difference between that is, one, we have a, a planned grazing plan um, that is focused on the amount of recovery time for the plants, whereas with rotational grazing, we were simply rotating the cows from paddock to paddock after a set amount of time. Um, with the adaptive multi-paddock grazing, we'll adjust the paddock size um, and the length of time and recovery based on a number of factors, including our stocking rates, our density rates on the farm, but most importantly, recovery time for the plants. And so this paddock was grazed a couple of days ago. As you can see, the cows are behind me further down the field. Um, we divide this field up into sections and move them along. Each day they get a fresh piece, a fresh paddock to graze in. Um, Nutrients for dairy cows are different than um, beef cattle, um, so we want to make sure they have as high a quality of forage as possible. Um, some of the issues that we had had previously here at the farm was, um, and we, we're still continuing to um, fix these problems, but we had a high compaction rate here. And these fields are by a brook, so you can see we have a, you know, this is a riparian zone here. Um, there's water that runs all along the tree line here. Um, and so this field is very wet in the spring. And so when we bring the cows out, we have to be careful that we're not um, compacting it. Um, so we tend to turn the cows out a little later in the spring to allow that to dry. Um, and because of the compaction that it's had, you know, we've had difficulty with the growth of the grasses that we might be looking for um, in our fields and a lot of um, pasture weeds, things like buttercups and burdock. And although people don't like thistle, um, thistle actually can play a good role in your field. It um, has a long taproot that brings up a lot of nutrients up to the surface. So when we are managing the fields, we're not managing for what we don't want, we're managing for what we do want. Um, and so that's an abundance and diversity of grasses, forbs, um, things like legumes, um, bird's foot trefoil, alfalfa, or some legumes that you would like to have in a pasture, um, along with orchard grass, things like that. Um, and so here, um, it's been, like I said, several days since we've grazed and the average height here, if you look at this grazing stick, is roughly around four to five inches. We, we try not to graze down any lower than that um, because we like to leave some of the forage behind. Um, and this is at the end of the season. Our fields have already had a frost the past couple of nights. And we also experienced a drought this year. So um, growth was very slow during the summer months. Um, and so the paddocks um, did take longer to recover. Um, and here we, we didn't keep up with the spring growth as well as we had hoped this year um, due to some fencing issues. Fencing is a really important part of a multi-paddock adaptive grazing system. Um, and we had lots of challenges with that this year. So um, that held us up a bit. And so some of the grass got mature, but we specifically didn't clip it because 
when you have drought conditions that makes it harder to recover and so that that saved us a little bit um, when everyone else's fields were getting brown or just the grass that we mowed here this still was at least green and lush and growing although growing slowly um, so anyway um, so we will wait maybe about 30 to 45 days although that will pit take us past the the end of the grazing season so we'll likely won't hit this paddock again this year. Um, it's been grazed about, I would say, maybe four, four times, four or five times this season with our rotation. Um, and you can see some of the, um, the manure patties left behind, they're decaying pretty quickly, which is good. Um, and you can see inside some of the holes for the dung beetles, which are great. Dung beetles help bring the nutrients back down into the soil, helping to um, increase soil health and fertility. Um, with the Savory Institute, um, some of the work they teach, there are, there are four processes, four ecosystem processes that we're looking at and managing for here at the farm. The first is the mineral cycle, the second is the water cycle, third is energy flow, and the fourth is community dynamics. And so when we look at the mineral cycle, we're looking at how nutrients are recycled here. So you'll, you'll have some of this litter that's left behind, this, this brown litter. And so what we're watching for is, is this litter getting back down into the soil and recycling and, and adding more nutrients. Again, the dung beetles here, they're adding nutrients to the soil, taking the manure from the cows and bringing it down into the soil. Um, so those are two mineral um, nutrient processes that we're, we're looking at. Um, and then with the water cycle, we're also looking how water flows. The water table is fairly high here. It starts coming off the stream or the, the hill up there. And so there's, you can't see it in this film right now, but it sort of slopes and runs down and then it all hits the brook. So the water table is pretty high. Um, as long as we have a lot of ground cover, we don't have to worry about erosion. And so as you can see, there's a fair amount of ground cover and we don't have bare ground here, so that's good. Um, but we do have to monitor for compaction when the fields are wet. Um, we were able to, um, even though we were organic and rotational, we had significant compaction issues, which we've been able to ease by giving the paddocks more recovery time. Um, and so, you know, we're, wa we're looking at how water flows and moves here. Um, and we're also looking at infiltration rates. Um, I won't do an infiltration testing here today, but we've done it before in this field. Um, and you want to look at how quickly the land can absorb the water. And that's important, especially in times of droughts, because it, if it can sink in and absorb quickly, the field will maintain that water um, during periods of drought and, and help keep um, your, your fields growing. Um, and then solar, we're talking about, you know, the energy from the sun coming down, hitting green grass and photosynthesizing. And we're turning that into a nutritional product. So for, or, or, it's, a, it's the food for the cows. And so here, um, you know, you want as much green grass growing as possible. Um, and so, you know, that's our, that's our goal here. And then community dynamics, we're just looking at the entire system here, the animals, the plants, and how they're all interacting with each other. So we're looking to have a diversity um, of um, plants and animals in the field, um, bringing nature back into farming. That's essentially what we're trying to do, create a natural habitat, um, because they all play a different role in helping each other. Another. Um, tool that we use and it's a tool that we use to monitor the land and the changes over time um, to evaluate our land management is it working or not is something called ecological outcome monitoring and we are just learning that process now and we'll be teaching that to other farmers so they can also use it as a tool um, to monitor changes on their land and what's nice about it is that it has both short-term and long-term indicators so it can give on the short term the farmer live real-time feedback um, whereas a soil test that might be more of a lagging indicator so um, that that has changes that are monitored over long term. Um, and so some of the short term indicators that we're looking at are things like, is there any erosion? 
Um, what is the canopy abundance on the land? You know, is there a lot of ground cover and how much of a volume of it? What, what's the height of the ground cover here? Um, we're also looking at diversity of species and also what are the contextually desired species and undesirable species like say buttercup. Um, and there are certain indicators that you can look for. For instance, if your, if your fields are starting to get overgrazed and overused over time, you'll see some of those um, key rear species start to disappear because they're very sensitive to overgrazing. Those are some grasses such as smooth brown grass, um, things like that will, will start to disappear. You may not see as many clovers. Um, for instance, um, white clover will thrive in an overgrazed environment, but you might not see as much red clover. And that's something we were looking to seed here, um, but based on the changes we made in our management practices, we noticed we had red clover starting to reseed again. Um, it's here in this pasture, but a lot of it has been recently grazed, so you won't see any of the red clover buds, but that was a nice um, thing that we were able to observe right after our first season. Um, so another indicator that we're looking at is litter decom decomposition in the field. And so um, here in this field, you'll see some of the litter. It's, it's on top. And if you dig down into the soil, you can see more of the litter um, as it touches the soil and it's decomposing. And, and here in a non-brittle environment where we have regular rainfall, it will decompose pretty quickly. And you can see it's brown. If we were in a brittle environment where rainfall is not regular, you might see this plant oxidizing and turns gray. It doesn't decompose. Um, so here in a, in a non-brittle environment, we're lucky. It's pretty easy to grow grass. It's pretty forgiving. But, you know, you can cause issues and you can have signs of overgrazing. So a lot of times people look out across the field, but what you really want to do is look down and see, is there bare ground? What's the volume of grass? You know, and we, we have pretty good ground cover and canopy here. It's not that high right now because it hasn't, it's been grazed recently. Um, but the litter is decomposing and incorporating into the soil, which is good. Um, and we've left enough um, post-grazing residual so that that will happen. Um, we also have good dung decomposition. Um, one of the farmers that works here, he used to work here years ago when we were continuously grazing the cows and we also had the horses in the pasture too and they would scrape the fields with the dung because it wasn't decomposing. It wasn't able to incorporate into the soil and so it's doing that really nicely now. So those are all good indicators that we're looking for. Um, and it contributes to um, the health of the soil and the fertility of the pasture. Um, and, you know, if you dug out a clump of grass, you'd see a lot of nice aggregates around the roots and um, root growth here. The soils are pretty shallow here, so our root penetration isn't, you know, that deep, but um, it's got, when you do, you know, harvest a clump of um, the grasses here as we did last year, you can see a lot of good aggregates forming and so there's a lot of soil biology going on as well. So a benefit of having livestock on the land is also that we can integrate it into our crop production and so we have a closed loop system trying to um, bring as much fertility to the farm from the farm rather than bringing inputs in from outside the farm. So the cows help not only um, add fertility to the pastures here, but also our crops, which we're going to go take a look at now. So you can see how we integrate livestock into our crop production. the Stonewall Farm crop fields. We grow here on approximately two acres, a variety of specialty crops that um, are, we sell through our CSA as well as the local farm store. Um, 
And it also serves as um, a classroom for our various education program. Right now we have some children in our um, remote learning program here in the greenhouses. I think they're harvesting the last of our tomatoes right now. So you'll hear shouts of joy as they, they pick the last of the golden tomatoes. Um, but right here there are five key principles that we're implementing around soil health that I wanted to demonstrate right from this field here. Um, and so the, the first one is um, plant diversity. And so if you're used to seeing typical fields, monocropped fields, they'll look very different. It's uniform, it's neat and clean. Here it looks like a little messy, maybe, you know, like a COVID haircut that's grown out after a while, but that's sort of intentional because what we're trying to do is bring nature back into the crop field. So here we have some hedgerows and these were all planted as forage in food for um, pollinators and beneficial insects. And so we have a variety of, um, oh, I just think I saw a little toad or grasshopper there. Um, we have berries and um, all kinds of um, early flowering um, shrubs that are helpful um, for the bees that we have here as well as um, beneficial insects. And then here we have an insectary strip and it's a variety of annuals. It's been um, touched by frost this week, so um, it's not in its full glory anymore. But this insectary strips provides habitat again for beneficial insects, not only pollinators, but other insects that help eat some of the pests that we have in the crop fields. And that's important. Um, it's an important bioconservation control that we implement here to keep the pests under control. Um, being an organic farm, we can't spray. Um, so we rely on natural management um, systems like this. And so we try to incorporate it throughout our crop fields and even in our greenhouses. And so um, you know, we still have some pest pressure, but we have noticed that it's, it's come a little bit more in balance. Yeah, so in this field, we've incorporated a variety of plant diversity, which is, you know, the first principle of soil health that I wanted to talk about. The second one is minimal disturbance. So we try to minimize the soil disturbance as much as possible. So leaving it intact, that leaves the soil structure intact. It leaves, um, doesn't disturb the life that's living there. And so we do that. We have these fields that are no-till and they haven't been tilled since, uh, let's see, 2015. And initially, um, the first season this field, this field lied fallow and we grew a barley cover crop. And then in the fall, we um, planted a winter no-till. And then the next year we planted our strawberries, which have been growing here for three seasons. Next season, we'll probably rotate them out with another new cover crop. Um, and so in, in with the minimal disturbance, you know, we've seen a variety of benefits. Um, we've seen the strawberries thrive. It's unusual to have three year strawberry plants. Um, and the soil, it does seem, the, the soil does seem to hold water longer, although they too were impacted a bit by the drought. The production wasn't as good this year, but it's hard to tell if that was because it was in its third year or if, um, you know, it was just the drought itself. Um, but the berries have been delicious, so we've enjoyed them thoroughly. Um, and another benefit of um, the no-till is that, um, you know, all of the insects in the, the soil biology remains intact. And so that's been really good for yields the, in the previous two years that weren't impacted um, by drought as much. Um, what we have noticed though this year in our fields is our brassica crops were eaten by ants. And because we aren't tilling, the ants have been able to come in and establish their colonies. And so we'll be looking at how we manage that particular um, negative side effect. So the third principle I wanna talk about is a living mulch. So we constantly try to keep the soil covered. That's to prevent wind and water erosion. It also helps keep the temperature down and cool, doesn't bake the soil, um, and adds organic matter and feeds the soil and all of the microbiology that's there. So we're gonna talk about that in our field that we cover cropped with rye last fall, and then we crimped it in the spring. So we're gonna go look at that field now. So being a dairy farm, we have access to um, 
a lot of nutrients that we can add back into the soil that we use right here from the farm. So in, in the background, you can see our um, compost wind rose. That's um, manure that we compost here on the farm from our fields, and we can use it to help grow our crops here. Um, and so that's particularly helpful for crops that need a lot of, that are heavy feeders. Um, and so the, so that's livestock integration and that's one principle of, of soil health that we're um, applying here at the farm. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to talk about was the cover cropping. And so this, um, this field that you're looking at was all cover cropped with rye and also um, some clover last fall. And so it grew over winter. It grew to a certain height when the rye, the seed head, um, achieved a certain height and then we crimped it um, with a roller crimper that we rented from our local conservation district and I believe that's available throughout the state. Um, and so we crimped the cover crop and then we um, hand sowed the transplants, all of the squashes here into this field. And what that did was it created a beautiful um, mulch that kept the ground moist you know, throughout the growing season and that was particularly helpful this year with the drought. Um, it will add nutrients back into the soil as it composts over the year um, and over this winter. And it also keeps a nice clean mat for the fruits to grow on. A consequence that we didn't in, intend upon was how much the voles loved it this year. And we're not sure if it was just a season where the, the voles were, you know, particularly in abundance or if this is just... Um, is something that will be ongoing, but we did have a lot of bull damage to our all of our squashes and pumpkins, except for the um, decorative pumpkins. They didn't seem to like those as much. Um, so we'll have to figure out, you know, going forward, um, how we'll how we'll work on protecting the crops um, from the rodents, because otherwise this is a great system here. It um, Use, incorporates a number of soil health principles here, keeping the soil covered, adding more nutrients to the soil, um, you know, creating a soil armor that helps um, manage the um, soil temperature, prevents water erosion, all of those things that we're looking to do to create um, a healthy environment for the plants. Um, there's lots more that we would love to tell and show you. So if you'd like to come for a farm tour, we have them scheduled um, frequently throughout the year in the growing season. You can always visit our website to learn more information about our tours that we offer here at the farm. Um, and a lot of them are hands-on so you can get involved and actually participate in some of the growing projects. So um, sign up for our newsletter and keep in touch. We really appreciate you joining us here today and um, hope you've enjoyed the tour. And um, we'll... Talk again soon. Okay.